as I said, it's with great pleasure that I um, get to chair this session and to um, introduce our speakers. So to begin with, Jennifer Rousel is the Professor of Literacies and Social Innovation at the University of Bristol's School of Education in the United Kingdom. Um, she's very interested in multimodal, maker-based, art-based, um, post-human effect approaches to literacy research. Um, we've been lucky enough here at QUT to have Jennifer as a visiting scholar here, uh, and I know those of us that engaged with her when she was here um, benefited at a lot from that. So she has indeed researched in Australia, Canada, the UK, um, and the United States. Um, and she's presenting today with two colleagues. The first, um, Mark, who is an experienced uh, inquiry, learning practitioner, researcher, and maker. Um, he's currently residing in the Netherlands, um, but has worked um, in a variety of different places across Europe. Um, his research explores critical making, multimodal inquiry, um, and how these things work together to reveal thinking. Um, and we also have Harriet Hand with us, um, who is like Jennifer at uh, the University of um, Bristol. She has a background in developing art and design led projects um, that seek to improve people's everyday experiences in, um, in their everyday lives. She's now studying as a PhD researcher at the University of Bristol um, and her doctoral project explores the affordances of mapping as a generative performative method for mobilizing thinking, um, particularly with uh, young people, 16 to 18 year olds. So we are so excited to have this group of people here to present um, for us today. And I'm gonna move on a little bit quickly just because I wanna make sure that we can get to the important um, uh, presentation. But before I do that, I do want to acknowledge that um, uh, several of us who are, who are beaming in from QUT um, are coming to you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagra people. I want to um, I want to talk about the fact that these lands were never ceded and that we still benefit from the fact that we are engaging on, on lands that um, as a result of disposition um, and in many cases violence um, and just to really you know recognize the privilege of what it means to work on on lands that have been um, looked after and who have had custodians for them for many many hundreds of thousands of years in um, in the case of of ourselves. Uh, so um, I also wanted to just highlight that um, on the 22nd in two weeks time, um, and you'll find this at the same place, uh, the events page where you registered for this session. We're very lucky to have Kathy Burnett and Guy Merchant um, presenting for us around unsettling critical literacy in digital childhoods. Uh, and the final thing that I um, need to talk about is just a couple of reminders. Um, as I said, the seminar is being recorded, so your image and voice might be captured if you decide to um, have your camera on or to unmute. Um, whilst the presentation is going on, just because we do have um, 70 um, people attending from around the world, so if you could turn your camera and audio off, that just might help us in terms of um, making sure that we keep our bandwidth going. Um, of course, if you're asking a question um, at the end of the session, very welcome to, to turn those two things back on. Um, and because I'm trying to manage, because it's fallen on me to manage the question part of this um, session, I'm going to ask people along the way if they wouldn't mind um, just putting into chat their name and who they'd like to direct a question to. That will just mean that I'm not looking aimlessly across for people's hands up if I can keep the chat running, um, hopefully. Um, that will be a way of managing having so many people who may well have questions and want to ask. So if we could make sure that everybody checks, please, I can hear um, in the background um, some background noise there. If we could just check about muting. I'm about to stop sharing and handing across to um, Harriet to, to share the screen. And I'll pass across to Jennifer to start the session. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Annette and Michael. It's such an honor to be the first uh, seminar. I know Mark, Harriet, and I are, are delighted to be here today. And I forewarned uh, Annette, Annette and Michael that we're going to have a bit of an alternative um, way of presenting. So I'm gonna step into Shakespearean narrator, if you indulge me, and I will open up. In December, 2020, three researchers came together to conduct a four month exploratory research study on intergenerational multimodal encounters with undergraduates at the University of Bristol 
and nine and 10 year olds in Delft, the Netherlands. We completed ethics and by February, we dove into our field work, February, 2021. There were three guiding principles to the research. Number one, it would apply post-qualitative emergent methods from Springe and Truman 2017 and others, of course. It would focus on younger to older generations. So that is how older people can learn with younger people. And it would move across our everyday digital analog homeschool inside outside spaces. The research began with parallel synchronous online mapping sessions in Bristol and Delft, and then moved into sensory social material activities and encounters in person and online over three months. The undergraduates were Will and Scarlett, and you'll get a sense of them during the presentation. And they met online with Harriet and me to make maps, share and discuss artifacts, talk about readings, and even walk around each other's neighborhoods together. The nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds had similarly had activities online and then face-to-face -face and went on walks with Mr. Mark and completed wayfinding, multimodal activities. There were around 10 activities that built off the notion of mapping. In May 2021, we completed our encounters in Bristol and Delft, and we moved into data analysis when Mark and Harriet went into a vortex of bricolage and mashing up of the corpus of data through various multimodal encounters and derives. It's been a study about adults and children entangled with their objects, on screens, off screens, and the things that they love and being in the middle of lived and felt experiences. We were alone often, but we were alone often together. Instructions for listening. Look and listen for instructions. Walk, stumble, not quite outside. What stories are embedded in the walk? Make a map, inhabit spaces. Where is the porosity? Form aggregates. What are the stories of these? Sit with it. Let things come to the surface. I seized our lockdown home learning as an opportunity, a possibility, making it a moment to capture this very special moment in history. Employing pedagogical tactics, I devised a series of engagements which interrogated the inside and outside of our lockdown learning spaces, encounters of thinking, making, doing. These organic modal encounters mapped our rhythms and routines, finding moments to share, to perform, to discover more about ourselves and each other and the spaces we inhabit. Mr. Mark's morning yoga, a series of art experiments, derives and acted as performances brought to the surface the already visible every day, such as making brunch alone together in silence, microphones open, alone together with computer, tablet cameras focused on our preparation, whilst considering the question, is everything in everyday life identical? Or a spa making natural face packs alone together, watching out, for the keyboard, whilst considering, is it more relaxing being in a digital school? Things arose to the surface. Our inquiries disrupted the notion of learning, and in particular, the loss of learning through home learning. Interpreting, misinterpreting the scores, permitting things to happen within the space of possibility. This was our opportunity to experiment. Providing children with the opportunity to find their sense of self through positioning, the senses, independence, voice, choice, and embracing their agency and the wonder of their own interpretations. Mr. Mark, every sound has a different memory. So my mind wondered, for example, Raining outside reminded me of drums, a rock concert for my birthday. 21 Pilots, Red Hot Chili Peppers was canceled because of Corona. Corona is the present time right now, which brought me back. I felt upset 
because rain is like crying. In my mind, I see pictures. Somehow, I like to map them out in my head. It's addictive, pleasurable. Like a rhizome, Mr. Mark's words. Thoughts were outside, tuned into the loudest. If, you've told, if you're told to listen to something, then you notice it more. Everyone was dotted around the house in separate rooms. Dad was the loudest when on his calls, he had noise cancelling headphones. To elaborate a little on how mapping played a part in this project, I might start with the agency of mapping, the agency it has in bringing previously disparate things into contact. Corner brings this to life with his image of the map as a stage, a theatre, where the actors are brought together to perform. An early mapping was one I made after our first walk when the project really began to pick up speed. The productive qualities of the three of us sharing our walk in our different neighbourhoods, our thoughts, our feelings, in dialogue, an unspoken felt experience of place, continued to perform in my mapping afterwards as place, memories, feelings, images moved about on the surface of my map, continuing to do their work, making new connections and fueling ideas, hopes, anticipations for the project. What I want to emphasise here is that it's not so much about the map as much as the mapping. Kitchen and Dodge in their 2007 article foreground the notion of mapping as a practice. Mapping as being of the moment, always mapping, emergent, unstable. Once it's unleashed from the notion of representing some kind of truth, we're able to see mapping for its ongoing, in-process generative properties. For us, this is a wholly affirmative spirit, an encouraging and supporting performance that takes inspiration from Deleuze and Guattari, who advocate we should make maps, not tracings. Tracings bring us back to the same. Maps construct new possibilities, infinite stories, continuously unfolding. Mapping became a site of experimentation and play for Jennifer, Mark and I, the children, for Will and Scarlett. We made mappings of our everyday journeys, our spaces pre-pandemic, our spaces of lockdown, sounds of inside, outside, our favourite things, a shared soundscape. It was a medium through which we, as researchers, became entangled in the project itself as we played with artefacts from the encounters on the infinite surface of a shared digital whiteboard. One of the shared mapping events was listening and mapping of a soundscape that Mark had built by melding together sounds of lockdown from our first walk and his previous archive of recordings. The performance score created a backdrop from where memories, hopes, fears emerged that traversed space and time, new connections unfolding for each of us. Nostalgia for social spaces, feelings of peace with sounds of nature. It stirred up emotions in relation to the pandemic Children imagined being adult, and for some of them, their lives in Delft fused with memories of family homes, their grandparents. In my map, the sounds activated my feelings of myself in lockdown and anticipation of change. As Rosa Bredotti puts it so well, in the present, we found traces of who we were becoming. This is the agency of mapping to stir things up, animate and shape new paths, if we allow it to which is where I'm reminded of Deleuze's notion of our assumptions that thought must make sense to us. As researchers, we gave little direction for mappings, just prompts. We stepped back and allowed chance encounters for the children to interpret instructions in their own way. So we were not always in control. We wanted this to be a way of being open to what emerged, whether it made sense to us or not. One way that new stories unfolded was through layering techniques, something familiar to me in my cartographic work working in cities as a designer, where there each layer is organised around a coherent theme, but when combined, they produce more than the sum of their parts. Returning to Corner, who again paints this picture so well by getting us to imagine the gym floor, where lines of basketball are laid over netball or badminton, which leads to the possibility of new hybrid ways of playing. 
So here, mappings of pre-lockdown and lockdown spaces are entangled relations of online, offline, inside, outside, pre and post pandemic lives. Will's image of the university library is layered with outdoor spaces for walking. A child's image of comfort is layered over Scarlett's objects of lockdown, an intergenerational aggregate that stirs up new ideas about our relationships with our everyday things. So in devising the research uh, and interpreting data, we leaned heavily, obviously, on the notion of becoming with matter, focusing on interactions between matter and humans during the 2020-2021 pandemic. The rationale for post-human feminist new material theory rests on their ability to look at more than humans, to look at the agentive qualities of our home environments, of the things that, uh, that matter to us that are rendered invisible during the everyday. Now, we're by no means post-human or new material uh, experts, but we found it helpful to problematize a privileging of certain types of knowledge and ways of being over others. Barad describes a meeting up of humans with non-humans as an assemblage of individual events, entities, and sets of practices. These assemblages are not only productive, but also carry human and more than human agency. For people during lockdown, screens, trees, birds, bodies, beds are not separate or less than during events and practices, but instead co-constitute each other, move together, assemble and entangle. They imbue meaning and life into everyday practices like looking at a screen. Adopting post-qualitative inquiry gave us a way to engage with critical qualitative methodologies. There's a kind of noticing that happens with sense-making through interactions with the world in the most expansive way possible. So Mr. Mark asks his children in his classroom to ask their rooms and, ho and homes questions. For example, questions to the bed. Is the pillow a part of you? Does it, does it hurt for me to lie on you every night? The relations of self and object are thrown closer together, imbued with empathy. The question shifts feeling and thought to the notion of becoming with the world. Throughout the maps, scale and detail, bring emphasis to the importance of children's toys and agency is thrown into relief. Toys, for example, often have features in these maps, color, their recognizable forms, details, the kind of work that Fluit and Woods and Woolwin and Mavers and Paul look at in their work, where in contrast, furniture and architecture are often reduced to, to symbols, even punctuation. As well, Mr. Mark, asked his class to think about outside sounds, inside and outside sounds. So it was a way to attune children to the kinds of sounds that happened during lockdown to give them agency. They started um, mapping sequences of sounds and associations, the relations between spaces and places and people and objects that were activated when they heard them. At the suggestion of the children, Everyone posted their map at the same time, making the sharing event into a ritual. To unpack the smallness and seemingly quiet nature of lockdown, the encounter compelled the children to be aware of cascading sounds around them over a brief period of time. For 10 minutes, they listened to outside and inside sounds, and we did the same in Bristol. Gunter Kress argues that children's pathway into writing derives from an unbiased modal interest in what best suits a composition. Drawing from this insight, what we recognize in children's inside-outside spatial maps of sounds are thoughts, feelings, people, objects that bubble up and matter. Driven by interests, memories, and felt sensibilities, the children responded to sounds based on gut instincts and motivated by affect and sentiments. The exercise of quiet listening also dislodged a met metaphoric thoughts like, I hear birds tweeting when I'm outside and it was like a world of peace. Drawing relations between inside and outside sparked an engagement with anticipation of futures for the children. In many, um, in many other maps outside became after lockdown. This map is an example of how the entanglement of hopes, for example, to see family and concern for the unexpected, the things that the child says are not calm are made visible. What unfolds as they describe the surprise reactions to changes with this, they refer to COVID-19 restrictions as not their own surprise, but their lived and felt experience of the unsettling sounds of adults' discussion. Here we made note 
that the, that the act of mapping work to mobilize thoughts and feelings that are often hidden, and they are so enmeshed in past, present, and futures. So there were some unacknowledged sounds they, they noted, like the sound of yawning, or a guinea pig drinking, or how owls sing. So the resulting maps and the children's reflections on them were rich with multi-century animations of their home learning worlds. What was also animated was the embodied felt interactions. I heard the rain, which is like crying. I heard myself think. And it helped us see the mapping as an affirmative method of activating multi-sensory experiences of space. We returned to school, not quite, almost. Rhythms were disrupted. Happy to see friends, sad to leave the comforts of home where learning begins at nine. As a class, we were alone in school, in our own bubble, but together, not quite. With contact restrictions in place in school, we went outside, we walked, we followed the color red, walked in just a straight line. We played smartphone tag, we listened for the soundscapes. We walked the maps we drew from our imagination. The magical story boxes, digital images captured of real life Joseph Cornell inspired memory boxes and from objects around our learning spaces. We discovered local hidden places. We sometimes only returned home at home time. We considered the simplicity of talking and learning together again, making these moments performative through recording podcasts. During an engagement that crossed over from remote to in-class learning, I asked the question, what can we learn by sewing a circle? Over the preceding weeks, we spent some time sewing circles, unpicking endless stitches and retracing paths, adding a further layer derived from our imaginary maps made real through walking. Concluding the series, and to make special the moment, we recorded our thinking. Mr. Mark, on the path the stitches are small and neat, but on the reverse side, there are lots of knots representing another side of me. Another child continues. Mr. Mark, Beneath the surface shows many different personalities. You see, everyone has mysteries in their life or things unwrapped. I have mysteries I haven't yet solved, like those knots beneath the surface. I shared a redacted text about estuaries with Mark and Jennifer. I was interested in the properties of brackish water where the river meets the sea. Brackish water was helping me think about the simultaneous vulnerability and productivity of becoming researcher, of creative thinking practice for my project and of being in lockdown. I redacted the article to see what would emerge from the text if I took words away rather than looked at the ones, looked for the ones that made sense. So the practice is associated for me with the artist Tom Phillips, who made a project of redacting a book, The Humorment, with his artwork. He obscured and removed portions of the text to leave something that took on a new life of its own in relation to what he had drawn, painted. This was a way of doing that resonates for us with Matsai and Jackson's encouragement to think with theory because it activated a dialogue between theory and practice. Jennifer lit a candle, made it a moment, we constructed new words that we shared. We allowed ideas to bump up against each other from academic journals, works of art, music, transcripts from our online conversations, past projects, or audio recordings of the children. This was non-representational work that was breathing life back into these texts and added to our lexicon for the project in the form of a verb list. Mark was reminded of the artist Richard Serra and these verbs became ways of doing, but for, but for us, it was also ways of doing for matter. We layered, we brought things together, but the map animated, the black marker pen disrupted, the photocopier fused. 
here we're getting into the analytical moves that we made on the project and we wanted to share one other voice with you. Um, this is Will speaking, an undergraduate who recorded an audio after mapping their spaces of pre-pandemic and of lockdown. Mark had redacted the transcript of one of the audio recordings and he read it to me on one of our team's calls. We were both moved by Will's words and I said I would redact the second audio. The two redacted texts struck, struck up a dialogue and I'll read you a passage. My way of learning is learning by doing. I'll wean myself off digital. Maybe I'll start now. Like the skateboard environment where you watch and try it, how it's made, how it's created, trial and error, trial and error. Maybe I'll become a bit more productive. Looking after plants, it's a good start to the day, a routine, a little bit of purpose, humbling, grounding. I enjoy this, it characterizes me. Looking over the city, immersed in greenery, feel like I'm not in the city. I'm not proud of driving, fuel consumption, time in traffic jams, not something I enjoy. M32, M5, M4, M32, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I'm not connected to it. What do I do nowadays? Am I enjoying what I'm doing? Instructions for listening. Look and listen for instructions. Walk, stumble, not quite outside. What stories are embedded in the walk? Make a map, inhabit spaces. Where is the porosity? Form aggregates. What are the stories of these? Sit with it. Let things come to the surface. This concludes the tale of two cities during a historical moment, the pandemic 2020, 2021. Making research happen across screens and bodies and sharing spaces with objects we love in tight spaces, digital analog across ages and stages. That's it. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I'm, I'm clapping, I'm clapping profusely. Um, uh, so, wow, um, what an amazing uh, presentation and what an amazing project. Um, I'm just blown away and, uh, you know, we couldn't have uh, asked for a better way to, to start our seminar series. So, so thank you so, so much for that. Um, look, I just found it. Uh, so, what, so what I'm going to do now is just um, ask each of you one question, I think, um, in this kind of panel part of the, uh, of the session, and then we'll open it up to um, general comments. So please um, get your general comments uh, ready. Um, and as Annette said earlier, um, please uh, put those in the, in the text, uh, sorry, in the chat um, area, and she'll pick up on those and, and then invite you to ask your questions. Um, but look, that was just such an incredibly uh, exciting and provocative way to consider learning, I think. You know, um, I, I really love the really creative and poetic way that you um, presented the research as well. Um, I think when we come into these sessions where we're considering socio-materiality, you know, um, the, the, the work can go in so many different directions and, and you know, this socio-material theory can be applied to so many different types of learning or can be, you know, that lens can be applied in so many different ways. So um, I was really, really, um, uh, really, yeah, just blown away by by the way that you've approached this. Um, and I'll be thinking about it for, for weeks to come, I think. Um, it seems to me that it was a deeply, you know, that what you've presented um, is really interesting because at this moment where uh, we found ourselves in history where we're online and so on and, and everything has become so digital in certain ways. It seems to me that, um, 
you've presented a really deeply human um, story of of what you you know of what you captured. You've you've presented. Uh, you know, you've you've centered the human in a socio-material context in a, in a really interesting and provocative way, um, and I think it's um, yeah, it's just such an incredibly it's an, an incre it's incredibly interesting in terms of a response to this to this really strange predicament we found ourselves in for the past eighteen months. But um, Jennifer, if I can um, start with asking your question first, um, and this is a question about methodology and. Um, in, a, in a way, the approach that you've taken with this um, kind of terrifies me as a researcher, you know, I, I mean, it's kind of um, super, you know, this sort of work is actually quite challenging and risky, I think, as research. Um, it's not standard data collection, you know, it's, um, it's not what we think of when we think of gathering data about um, how young people are learning online or, or learning in, in the classroom or just learning in daily life. Um, and so in a sense, you know, this idea of producing assemblages of as data is a little bit frightening, I think. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you know, what are the things that, you know, researchers who want to follow this kind of path in research, what are the kinds of things that they should be aware of? Um, you know, what are the things that you learnt? What were the challenges or difficulties? Uh, and, and what were the triumphs in a way that you had by applying this particular methodology? Thank you, Michael. That was so generous of you. Um, and, and I have to admit, I was a bit worried for your first seminar to do something like this, but, um, but it was so much fun for us to work on it uh, together. And to me, it was an incredibly moving project. So, uh, and what I did say in the talk is that I don't feel like I'm a post-human new materialist expert. I think it's really important to say that because there are people who have devoted their whole career to it. Um, and it, it, is, it is a bit of a, I'm a bit of an imposter saying that, but um, I suppose, I suppose it sometimes it actually goes back and I mentioned Gunter a few times because I started with Gunter Kress and Brian Street. So I started in that um, appreciation for beyond books and words and so on and so forth. So starting that way, it was such a gift because it gave me a path to start to think about literacy is really expansive. So I think that I knew early on I had to use other methods and be a bit of a magpie and, and, and use other methods along the way and, and gather them up. So I suppose what I would say to researchers in the talk, in the, in the room, is that that can be really generative. And you have people who already do that. Uh, so you have, I think, Jackie Duarte's in the, in the audience and Scott's in the audience and, and others who, and you do that and Annette, and you realize with time that you need to, you need to be able to, um, open yourself up to other ways of thinking about data, especially now, because we know that this is different. We know the pandemic was different and it was really hard, right? So I suppose Alone Together specifically as a project was really special for me and I think Harriet and Mark, and I could never do it without Mark and Harriet. Like it just wouldn't have been possible because they're both artists, they're both researchers, they're both highly creative. Um, and I'm an old ethnographer, right? A multimodal ethnographer. So that's one thing. And so you needed, I needed other people and we needed to work together in a, in a kind of democratic way where we said, what are we gonna do? Um, and then social material theory has worked because it really has give, given dimension. And it's been able to look at children beyond just thinking about them in terms of a screen, but actually really nuance that. Um, and, and humanize it and, and give it give it a life um, in ways that, as I said, Gunter Kress did um, and uh, in the ways that others have, I think that that's everything, right? I really wouldn't be doing what I do if it weren't for humanizing um, what literacy is. So that's my long winded answer. I don't know whether that's helpful for people, um, but that's what I would say. No, I think, I think that's a really um, terrific answer. And I think it's, um... Yeah, it just it just reminds me that uh, you know thinking beyond um, standard def definitions of literacy, I suppose, thinking about the multimodal, the sensory, the material, and so on, just op opens up a whole world um, for researchers. You know, it can you know, and, and I think yeah, what you've presented us um, really is very illustrative of that. So so thank you. Um, so Mark, I wanted to uh, turn to you. I I really loved. 
um, that question about, uh, so I, I love, for a start, I love the provocation of being alone together. You know, I think that that's a really um, terrific kind of um, play on words and, and is so applicable to this moment with the pandemic and doing on school online and, and so on. You know, we hear so many young people and students um, saying that they just want to get back to school to be with their friends and so on um, and that they, that they miss that so much. Um, I, I really like the way that you asked that question of, uh, is it more relaxing being in a digital school? Um, you know, that was really wonderful. Um, and you talked about allowing children to embrace their agency through their senses. Um, and that really goes to the heart of this, this socio-material approach, I think. Can you talk just a little bit more about, uh, I suppose, the you know, how school has changed and um, just extend a little bit more on what you saw through this project in terms of, you know, the, the students, ex students, ex students ex experiences of, um, of the digital school, if you like, and then the blended school and so on. Yeah, I think for, for the kids, kids tend, my kids in class here tend to take probably everywhere, I tend to take everything a day to day. Once they've done something, they've done a piece of writing, I'm done, and they move on. And, and, in, a, and in a way, being in the lockdown space was a little bit like that, that, you know, the, my class, my, the situation in class was built up towards a second lockdown. I'd planned it six months. I, I saw it coming. I'd done the preparation so that they were aware of what was coming on screen and, and the mapping practices and the walking was already taking place and that agency that, that I, I give them to make their own decisions was really highlighted then as we went into lockdown in this digital school because you can provide the most detailed instructions with a voice recording with a video sometimes kids will listen to it they'll interpret it however they want and I think as, a, as an educator, you can get really frustrated sometimes. And I, I thought, well, we're all in this together. We are all in this alone together. Let's back off. Let's see what happens in this, in this space of misinterpretation or reinterpretation. And let's go with that. As Harriet was saying, you know, the photocopier did this or, you know, the, the highlighter did this. Also, the, the recording or the text, the scores that I sent evolved into actually less than more. I, I provided less instructions and just to see where they went with them. And the, you referred to the question about, is it re more relaxing? You know, that was an hilarious moment that we had together because we all made facials out of yogurt and, and honey. And, you know, not really thought about that and computer screens and keyboards, um, but it did work. There's only a bit of yogurt damage. But it's, it's those of making those moments really special and, and concrete through through actually you know th that thinking making and doing doing together a bit of a garbled answer i hope that makes some sort of <laughs> sense no it, it it absolutely does it, and i love you know what you've just said about um where computers fit into all of this like it when i was listening to you all talking it, it just felt like the computers somehow faded into the background right the technology didn't really seem to be present in a way, which I thought was really wonderful because it had to be present for the, you know, for the project to occur. Um, um, so that image of, you know, dropping yogurt on a keyboard is, it brings it back to that visceral kind of um, sense that yes, the technology is there and yes, it can be damaged or, or whatever. Um, I really love that, thank you. Um, so Harriet, I, I just, um, for you, I'd like to know a little bit more about the, the mapping and the, the mapping methodology and, um, and I guess um, the, the agency related to mapping. So you talked about um, mapping as a practice, being emergent and unstable. Uh, you talked about prompts and chance encounters and not being in control as researchers. Can you, can you just extend uh, on that a little bit? And I think at the heart of my question too is this, um, and, and you know, it's been at the heart of my question for all of you, I think, but really it's this question about um, at children's agency, what does it mean to be agentive? Um, and I think it was really um, clear in your, your presentation that there was agency, there was absolutely agency, but could you just talk a little bit more to 
how mapping enabled that agency to to occur thank you thank you michael um so i guess it's i'll start with just it's a particular approach to so it's a way of thinking about mapping um not as a prescriptive tool so i've recently been read reading uh, richard sennett talking about tools and it's been really interesting because he talks about the all-purpose tool as being the one which sort of ignites our imagination and our curiosity of how we could use it um, in a different way and i'm decorating um, at the moment in my house and how i use the screwdriver to open the tin of paint and um it's made me think about this sort of notion of mapping as an all-purpose tool in the sense that um, it's really about relations, um, but there's very few, few rules. And I think the way mapping is now being used, and it is increasingly being used in research and by artists particularly, um, is that it's a very open multimodal um, manner of, of bringing ideas and thoughts and feelings together. So it could be made of photography, it could be a, a walk, it could be, um, you know, dialogue in, in some respects as a form of mapping. So I think playing with that idea um, is really interesting for me. And I think the idea of it being emergent and for chance is what I found in my own research with young people is by seeing something visually um, Kevin Lynch, who's an urbanist that I'm, I'm really familiar with, sort of talks about us inhabiting space once we map it. And what I see is, is young people sort of inhabiting what they're beginning to map. And as they're moving around that space, um, they kind of go a bit further, maybe. They, they kind of explore things, things pop up. The unexpected happens. They see relationships sort of emerging between things which they hadn't anticipated before. And it's quite exciting, this idea, you know, for me as a sort of creative practitioner, the idea of half formed thoughts. So the way that mapping, for example, might bring those forward and unfold things, um, which seems to happen. And maybe that's partly the visual, um, but maybe that's also because we're giving ourselves time to sort of inhabit um, a space and explore it. Um, and the second part you talked about, about children's agency, one thing I wanted to mention, I think Mark touched on it there um, when he spoke, was sort of permission. We've talked about this a lot, the three of us, in, in some respects, and it goes back to what you were saying about it being frightening, um, is stepping back, you know, and it's, it's really having a sort of, uh, in some respects, confidence, but also a sort of understanding that the disruption and the things that happen that you didn't expect are all really positive um, contributing factors because that's when different things happen. You know, Deleuze talks about this in difference rep and repetition that, you know, nothing is the same, even repetition is different. And I think it's uh, exciting for us to think about how children sort of, if you step back, how that you allow that to happen as much as that might make you feel quite vulnerable at times. Oh, thank you. That's um, that's a really um, wonderful explanation. And look, what what I think I'll you know um, this is the last thing I'll say, and then I'll pass over to Annette uh, to just open it up to questions. But I think um, what I find really exciting about your presentation is the the application of theory to practice, and you know um, the the real sense of 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 um, uh, the children's learning and the children's experiences and 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 the opportunities and agency that was produced for them was was really clear and visceral for me and um, i think sometimes when we talk theory um that doesn't happen right you know um we we were trying to work out how to apply the theory to the practicality of what's happening in the classroom um and but I think you've captured it beautifully. I think you've you know the balance that you have with this um, with this work and with this presentation is really fantastic. So so thank you so much. Um, so I'm handing over to Annette now, and I can see 18 comments in the chat. So there must be some questions there, Annette. There's definitely some questions there. Thank you. Um, well, since Michael finished with um, something that was going to stay with him, I have jotted down here on my page, and I think it's going to stay with me. The very idea that you know, turning over the cloth means that the knots on the other side represent me. I, I just, you know, I think when we stop to listen to young people and children and, and how they are able to articulate um, 
being and becoming in the world. Um, you know, it can really open and, and scratch open some of those spaces. So we do have a couple of questions. I'm going to throw one. Um, so Kate Cowan, who may like to put on her um, her demute herself um, and ask a question of Mark. Kate, did you want to do that or will I? Yeah, sure. Um, so it was Mark mentioned um, playing smartphone tag and I just wondered if you could say a bit more about what that is. It's, it's tag, I'm going to be really tag with the smartphone. You use a smartphone, I use my son's old, old phone and, to, and you say one, two, three, go, someone's on, they have the phone, they run around, you give them 30 seconds to go and hide, you run around and you capture everyone as a photograph rather than by tagging them. So if you're good, you can do it really quick and do a quick panoramic if the kids aren't good at hiding. But what's really good is you can't cheat because when you come back after the countdown to finish, you come back and you're saying, well, you didn't get me, you know, you're, you're lying and everything. So no, sorry, look look at the camera, you're, uh, you're there, you're, you're in shot, you're wearing that blue jumper. So um, that's the game. Excellent. That's Thank my you. idea. I can't remember whose idea it was. It was a, a, a Danish academic and I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but it was it was his sort of idea that I modified. Excellent. Okay. It's Thanks. a genius game. It's it's the best use of an old phone ever. And great for social distancing, I Thank suppose, you, as well. And not to tag. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Um, so I'll throw now to Davina. Um, Davina, would you like to ask your question or will I ask it for you? Oh, I can do that. Thank you so great. much. So, um, I was wondering, uh, it's under normal circumstances during research, it becomes difficult to sometimes explain to children in, in, um, in terms that they would understand what we're doing and why we're interacting with them. And then this is something so different and it's so unique. I wonder how you navigated explaining to them what it is that you're doing and how they're part of, of the project. and the ethics of it all. That's a great question, start. Davina, but start. I'm going to give it yeah. to Mark. <laughs> yeah, I'll just start, just before, sorry, Jennifer, but just, just to say that the, the, the lockdown experience for us was just an extension of everything we'd been doing in class. You know, we're fortunate enough that there is this group of children was my class this year, this group of 20 or so children. Now, that's a very fortunate space that we're in. And the way that I, I we're an inquiry-based uh, program here in school, and the way that I practice is, is very open. Um, lots of mapping practices in place already, lots of exploratory engagements outside. It was just a continuation of, just viewed through a slightly different lens of being at this, this alone together. So in terms of, you know, selling it to parents, if you like, or, or to the kids. It was just like, you know, there goes Mr. Mark again. We're doing Mr. Mark's morning yoga. Or it was just taken as, as an everyday thing, you know. And, and when it was done, it was done. And we came back to school. It was, you know, it was interesting sharing this project with them at the end. And I, I you know, she talked about Harriet and Jennifer and Will and Scarlett. And they were aware of, of the distance, how, how long it would take to walk from Delft um, taking a ferry to to Bristol and those sorts of things. We, we did lots of things around the whole project as well. So they were fully aware of this, this connection, even though it was slightly, slightly abstract in a way. And that made it that made it just be really, really natural. Jennifer, I don't know if you'd like to continue. Uh, yeah, no, I was just, uh, that's a great, I mean, that really captures it. And I think Mark has a way of, of talking to kids about what the project was. So Davina, there's both a formal answer, which is that, you know, obviously we went through the whole ethics, but, but, but the, the important ethical process piece is that there were lots of conversations and lots of kind of, the children were separate, right? We didn't know who they were. We didn't know names. We didn't know, we had, we had a general sense of them and, and their, the way they were in the world kind of idea. And then equally with Will and Scarlett, because we dealt with some, I mean, we didn't talk about private things or we didn't delve into sort of emotions or um, accept in terms of how they were feeling. It wasn't that kind of project. It was a project where we was much more of a sense of um, esprit de corps. We were all together, right? And it really helped out that way. So that's not a great answer, Davina, but that's an answer trying to get at the, the spirit of the project and how ethics was a, ethics was a process. It was a conversational process that was spread across the whole project. 
And Mark was very careful to keep the children in the classroom as private, separate, confidential, but we had a sense of, of, of who they were and how they were experiencing it. Does that, does that make sense, Davina? Thank you for that, Jennifer. Um, Davina has already put up thumbs up and hearts. So okay. yes, I think you've, you've both managed to answer that. Um, it's Good. probably worth noting that um, since we're in a session called Alone Together, Davina's coming to us from India. So just to give a bit of a spread um, around who's who's able okay. to be here um, because we are doing this online. Um, I wanted to shoot now, particularly because I'm really interested in this as well, because it's conundrums that I um, play with on a minute by minute basis um, when I'm trying to do work you know, a little bit like this. So I'll ask Kylie to come in and ask her question. Kylie Stevenson, who's coming to us from Perth or from Western Australia, I should say, sorry. I am, hello everyone. Um, I'm on Wajak Nuwabuja in Perth, um, in Jindalup at the moment. Um, so I think everyone who's, has read my question in the chat, who will follow in the chat. So my question is about how you, um, move into publishing in those um, more traditional areas, taking this work into a tra traditional area, get it accepted and without losing the richness and the creativity of the work. You know, you can certainly publish in, um, you know, those journals which are, um, you know, which are art artistic research methods journals. But if you're publishing in traditional social science and education markets, how do you, I guess, translate this work? And I'm particularly thinking of this, the Centre for Digital Child working with the School of Medical Health Science or working with the School of Nursing and Midwifery and we're going to be publishing together and how we keep this richness um, or does it become, you know, flat, if you like. So that's really my question, um, how you've dealt with that, uh, translating your research into to other publication markets, if you like. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does make sense, Kylie. Okay, so I misinterpreted and my, my answer in the chat is, is not correct. And then I'm going to let Harriet chime in here. But just quickly, um, well, the way you work within the genre. So, you, so we're, we, have three dis, we have three outputs from this project. One is a chapter, one is an article, and then the other one, Mark and Harriet are leading, and it's um, a multimodal article. So that's the artistic piece. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly um, doable to, to translate that, this into an academic voice, a social science-y kind of a, a, a register. And that's by drawing on the theory that we did, explaining the method, explaining the ethical process, and then um, really going through what, the what, what was born out in the research creation. So it's actually kind of a simple answer that, that yes, I mean, it depends on what reviewers say. It might be an article that's rejected, we'll try somewhere else. But it's something that is, can translate across, across genres. Um, whether it could be applicable to medicine, I would I would say yes. I mean, it's it's a, it's a it's it's about well being. It's about the, the children. It's about the life of children. So um, yeah, but but Harriet will have another response. I'm putting her on the spot. That's okay. Thank you, Kylie. Um, I've just got lots of questions that we'll probably share because I it really challenges me to know how to. Um, how to disseminate, how to talk about something which is in movement, which is dynamic, how do I, how is that um, possible to share? Um, and I think one of the ways that um, has really helped us is by keeping everything moving. Um, and I did mention the whiteboard in the talk, but Mark and I kind of set up a whiteboard where things could kind of literally live in the same space um, on the same surface. And so for us to resist trying to um, structure and, and make linear this process. And I think we've tried to do that in the presentation today so that things interweave and you keep that interweaving of things. So in writing, um, two things that, that I want to sort of, I suppose I want to think about experimenting with, and I certainly haven't got answers. As I say, I've got more questions that we could share, I think, than I could provide answers for, but is to, first of all, kind of keep that interwoven nature of the research um, to reflect the fact that theory, um, different voices in the project spoke to each other um, in the way that the artifacts came together and things sort of melded across 
um, the time that we were working, but also to leave open some space for the reader, I think. That's quite important for me. So um, the pauses, I don't know in, in written how, how that works, but for me, it's about allowing the reader to get a sense of the richness. So not being reductive, finding ways to kind of leave space for the reader to imagine that richness behind what you're writing. And um, that's a bit of a fluffy, blurry answer because I don't have a prescriptive way of doing that. But that's kind of my hope that, um, that I think this thing is something which continues to live. And that's the nature, isn't it, of everything that, you know, the ideas will continue to be generative and hopefully in, in being read by people, they'll be picked up and taken up and, and be interpreted or misinterpreted. Um, and in their own way, kind of keep that richness going. Um, so it is a real challenge and it's a real dilemma. And being a visual person, my instinct is always to layer everything with as many images as possible because they say so much more um, than words. But um, when you are restricted only to words, I suppose it's using that language in an open sense and keeping that the interwoven nature of the stories alive. Thank you very much, Harriet. Um, and you know, I think that's a, a brilliant place to stop, perhaps, um, particularly since as I was jotting down during your presentation, um, the notion of being of opening ourselves up to other ways. And I think, you know, that's kind of a call to arms that answers part of that question. I think it really is when we're in those conundrums and when we're not quite sure how to represent something that is shifting and moving and not let it become flat, you know, that's that's when we really are opening ourselves up and thinking. And the more that, um, you know, we do that and do that together, um, you know, perhaps the more that that, that takes, you know, some, um, you know, gets some traction onto the road as well. Um, I did um, promise Mark that I would get him away by six o'clock our time. Mark's heading off to, to teach his class. Uh, so we have one minute to go. So I am going to just ask everybody um, to represent in some way our appreciation of um, Jennifer, Harriet and Mark coming um, to us early in the morning in their time. Thank you so much. You really have opened our session in our seminar series in an amazing way. Um, I'm going to take that call to arms forward about opening ourselves to other ways as as the framing for our um our the rest of our seminar series so thank you jennifer thank you harriet and thank you so much mark and i hope you have a great day with with the young ones today um and as i said yeah if we can just represent um to our three presenters our appreciation i'd really be very pleased it's always such an empty um notion isn't it that there's no noise out there so i can only apologize for that <laughs> thank you thank very you. much thank everybody very much for... Annette and Michael thank you that's all right um, I think definitely the thanks needs to run in the other direction um, <laughs> thank you everybody for turning up please do have a look um, at our events page and see the other sessions that are coming forward um, Michael Lisa Kirvin and myself have attempted to bring together things that will challenge us to think slightly differently across this series of six or seven um, presentations um, thank you very much for taking your time out at the end of the day if you're here or whatever part of the day it is um, from where you're coming with us um, and we hope to see you in future seminars again so thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Jennifer. Thanks, Harriet. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Harriet. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Thanks, Annette. Take care. Exactly. Bye. Thank you very Thanks, much. Harriet and Mark. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.